Hey guys, what's up? My name is Gabe and this is Games with Gabe and this is the next episode in the coding a 2D game engine in Java series. As you can see here, I have done quite a bit off camera. So uh, towards the next few episodes, we will be working towards this where we basically have a fully functioning, almost fully functioning game. You can see that I have sounds playing and everything and that the game is kind of working. Uh, there are certain features I haven't implemented and there are still a few different bugs and stuff that I just haven't gotten around to fixing yet. But for the most part, we have a pretty functional game. Uh, we will also be adding a lot of improvements to the editor so we can multi-select objects, uh, duplicate them. So you can see I just duplicated all these and then you can delete the duplicated objects. You can move them around like I was with the keys and everything. You can move objects using page up and page down, change the Z index order of them. So you can see that I just moved that piece of uh, foliage in front of Mario and stuff. All these different things we will be doing. So. It's going to take quite a bit. If you want to take a look at the code that is required to get all this implemented, because I will not be able to get all this code in one episode, then you can take a look at this diff, which is all the different changes. I'll have this linked in the description, but I'm basically going to be referencing this for certain parts that we will be working on throughout today and the next few episodes we will be doing. Okay, so in this episode specifically, we are going to be working on the key combos to do like multi-select type of stuff and uh, draw this box and everything and get the keyboard combos and everything just working really nice with not any major bugs or at least none that I can find. So let's get back into our code and just to refresh ourselves, I believe we left off with just implementing uh, sounds, right? So we have our sounds down here, which we can sort of use within the game, which is good. So. Uh, we can't really do any of that multi-select stuff that I was doing in the editor and the best thing we can do is first of all let's go into our gizmo class and inside the gizmo class I have this to do that's been here for a while which says move this into its own key editor binding component class which is what we're going to do so we will grab this and then we'll go ahead and create a new sort of class over here I believe inside of components we have mouse controls so we'll also add in a new class and we'll call this key controls, okay? And what we're gonna do is have this extend component. And then if we go back into that gizmo, uh, we're gonna copy this and we will just move this over to the key controls, right? And we want to put it in its own update method. So we'll say public void update float DT. And we'll just wrap this in that function. And we just need to make sure that we mark this as override. Then I'll go ahead and import the GILFW constants. And now we have a little bit of a problem, right? Because we have uh, the properties window in the active game object. And let me just say too, the code that I've done for this is not code that I would recommend using, okay? I just wanna finish the game engine series. So all the code that we're gonna be writing is not necessarily the best way to do it, but it gets the job done, which is what I'm trying to do. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and figure out how to get the properties window and active game object. Uh, into here so that we can actually get these. So the way that I went about doing this is just the simplest way I could think of. Um, inside of this update method, we're just gonna go up here and we'll say properties window, properties window equals window dot get I am GUI layer dot get properties window. And I believe we added this get I am GUI layer utility function a while ago. So that'll be helpful for that. And then we're gonna go ahead and say game object active game object equals properties window dot get active game object which it auto completed for me so we'll just remove the this reference here and we will remove it here as well and uh, we're gonna change this to properties window dot set and active and we're actually gonna change this up a little bit too in just a second let's also move these return statements because they aren't needed anymore since we've abstracted this way into its own sort of class. Uh, before I forget to, let's go into the level editor scene initializer. And we're gonna have to add this key controls to our level editor stuff, right? So uh, right below mouse controls will say level editor stuff to add component, new key controls. That way we do not lose the functionality that we already have. And if we go back into key controls, now we sort of wanna make sure that this all works right. So right here, uh, this is our duplicate method. Uh, one other thing that we want to do real quick is just make sure that the active game object is not null, which it will be able to be when we make some changes inside the properties window too. So that way we just don't try to duplicate something if we don't actually have an active game object. And I'm going to change this to instead of 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 
we're just going to change this to grid our settings dot grid width and settings dot grid height that or actually I'm just going to change the y value to zero that way it just moves over one grid square to the right or to the left whichever way we want it to go one of the other things I'm going to do too is we will build this method in just a second but we're going to want this concept of active game objects right because if we have a multi select then there's the potential to have multiple game objects and so we'll also have a get active game objects function inside the properties window and this will basically just be like if they have multi selected and have several game objects selected right uh, pretty straightforward and so we basically just want to add in support there too so like if they're pressing the duplicate button. So we'll say if key listener dot is key pressed, Jill FW left or key left control and key listener dot key begin press, Jill FW key D and active game objects dot size is greater than one. So what this basically says is the same exact thing that we have here. If they're pressing the duplicate control D and we have more than one active game object. This will be null if we have more than one active game object. So then that means that if we have several, then it will fall through to this switch statement or this else if statement. And then what we can do is we can say that list of game object act or <clears throat> game objects equals new array list active game objects, which will just create a shallow copy of the active game objects. And then we're gonna say properties window dot clear selected, which is another function we'll add in which will just clear all the selected game objects. And then we'll go ahead and say for game object, go in game objects. We want to make sure we copy it. So we'll say copy equals go.copy. And we want to make sure we say window.getScene.add game object to scene. And we'll add that copy to the scene. And then we'll make sure to say properties window.add active game object which is another method we'll add and we'll just add the copy so that way we'll basically duplicate the objects and then set all the selected objects to the new duplicated objects right so we'll clear it and then we will add those all in and the delete method let's just change this up because basically uh get active game objects will always return all the active game objects so we only really care about one case here we'll just say if they press delete then we'll say for game object go and active game objects go dot destroy so we'll make sure to delete it and then we'll just say properties window dot clear selected which should clear all the selected game objects once again makes it a little bit simpler for the delete okay so let's go ahead and go into the properties window and we'll add these utility methods that we now need so we'll go into here and we're gonna have the concept of an active game object or we're gonna have a private list of game objects which is the active game objects right if they've selected multiple game objects and we'll just initialize that to null. And then instead of doing this in our I'm GUI function, what we're going to do is we're going to say if active game objects dot size equals one and active game objects dot get zero does not equal null. This will just basically make sure that we have multiple game objects selected or actually that we just have one, right? Because we don't want to show the properties window unless we only have one selected. And then what we'll do here is we'll just say active game objects equals uh, this dot get zero. So it should have the same functionality, except now we have support for multiple. And if we have multiple, we're not going to show the properties window since that doesn't really make much sense. And then let's go down and we're going to fix up a couple of these. So for get active game object, instead of just returning this dot active game object, what we'll do is we'll say, uh, do we have just one active game object? If we do, then we'll return this dot active game objects dot get zero. Otherwise, we will return null. So this way, if we have multiple game objects, we don't end up returning uh, the first object because that doesn't really make sense, right? And then we're going to go ahead and add in our utility function, just public list of game object, get active game objects, and then we'll just return this dot active game objects. And then I'm going to go ahead and expand these. I don't know why IntelliJ does this for me. <laughs> don't really like it that much, but we're going to go down here and we're going to say instead of uh, what we have, we're gonna say public void clear selected. And also we're not using this, so just remove that function, it doesn't really matter. And then we're just gonna go ahead and say this dot active game objects dot clear, and that should do it. And then for set active game object, instead of doing this, what we're gonna say is if go does not equal null, so they pass in a valid game object, we're, we're gonna say clear selected, then this dot active game objects dot add go. 
Uh, that way we make sure that we don't have multiple game objects and this will just set it so we just have the one which is what they sent to us. And then we'll go say ahead and say public void add active game object. And this will take in a game object, go. And we'll just say this dot active game objects dot add, go. Okay, cool. So that should sort of do it for us. If we run this, we should hopefully have the same functionality, uh, except we're getting an error real quick, which I believe is just because we never actually set active game objects. So we'll say this dot active game objects equals new array list. Yep, not really sure why we're setting it to null up here. We can just sort of get rid of that. <laughs> and then if we run this, we should get feature parity. So we should have the same stuff that we had before. It should work all the same. So if I click here, uh, not working. So we'll go ahead and see what's wrong with that. Uh, and I can see it already. It's probably just this right here. So instead of saying uh, active game object equals picked object, we'll just say set active object to the picked object. And then we can go ahead and try this again. Let's see if that fixes it. Yep, so now we click on it and we should be able to duplicate. And if all went well, I think that should have duplicated it. Not completely sure. I don't think I have key controls. Yeah, I don't think I have key controls. So let's go ahead and check that. We have key controls here. Oh, and I see what the problem is. Inside of key controls, we need to be an editor update, not update. So if we go back into there, we should be able to duplicate. It duplicates and we can delete. And that should delete. If I delete that, it'll be a little bit more clear. There we go. <laughs> so that's all working properly. Good thing we have that fixed. Now let's try and add in the multi-select box, right? Uh, first of all, in order to add that in, we're going to have to update our picking texture, which it won't be that hard actually. So right now in our picking texture, we just have this read pixel function and we will actually want a read pixels function, right? So we'll take in an int x, int y, and then an int width and an int height. This way we can read a block of pixels from the screen and basically just go through each one of those and check and see what the IDs are and return it to whoever asked for it. And we're gonna actually return a float array to the caller. And I'm actually going to simplify this a little bit more. Instead of doing this, we're going to say vector 2i start vector 2i end, which is just a vector 2 of integers. Okay. And that should be good. Then what we're going to do down here is we're going to say vector 2i size equals new vector 2i end dot sub start. So we get the size, which is the block of pixels, how big it is. And let's also make sure we take the absolute of that that way. If they like click and select to the left or to up to the right, and no matter what direction they click and drag, it will always give us the positive size. And then we can get rid of, or actually we're gonna change pixels to instead of three, we're gonna say three times number of pixels. And how many pixels do we need? Well, we just need the area of the square that we selected, right? So uh, float number of pixels, or actually that should be an int number of pixels equals size.x times size.y, which is the area of the square, right? So that should give us enough pixels. And then we can just say, instead of GL read pixels like this, we'll say start.x and start.y. And instead of width one, height one, we'll say size.x and size.y. And that should give us everything we need. Then we will simply return the pixels. But we do need to do one more thing. Uh, since we are storing all of our IDs plus one, we want to make sure to subtract one. So we'll say for int i equals zero until i is less than pixels dot length i plus plus and then we'll say pixels i minus minus or minus equals one uh, so we'll just subtract one from each one of those that way we get the appropriate game object ids from these pixels okay one other thing we're gonna have to do is let's go to the mouse listener because i did put some changes in here too just to make sure that the dragging and everything is working correctly so inside of the mouse listener Right up here, I added in just a couple of functions that will help us out. Public, static, void, and frame, which I know we just removed in like a couple episodes ago, but we're adding it back now. And then we're gonna have public, static, void, clear. Clear, we're basically just gonna reset all of our values. So we'll say get.scroll x equals zero, get.scroll y equals zero. Uh, and I think we can actually probably just copy all of this stuff and then we'll paste it here and then we'll just replace all of this with get because we're basically doing that and then we're going to say get dot mouse button down equals zero get dot is dragging equals false and then we will say we'll say arrays dot fill uh, get dot mouse button pressed 
with false, which will basically just uh, fill the array with the value false. So we'll reset all the mouse buttons that nothing is there. So this clear function is just something that we will use at certain times. We'll see in just a minute. And then right here in end frame, we're just gonna say get dot scroll y equals zero and get dot scroll x equals zero. Cause I was having some trouble where this was not getting called all the time and that was not good. So inside of our mouse pose callback, what we're gonna do is instead of uh, doing this reset dragging, basically if the mouse button down is greater than zero, uh, we're gonna change this up to say if not window dot get I am GUI layer dot get game view window, which we're gonna add and this is one of the parts where like, I don't like how this works, but I'm just doing it because it will get our job done very quickly. And we're gonna say dot get want capture mouse. So if the game view window doesn't want to capture the mouse right now, we're just gonna clear all the values because basically we don't want our key controls to be doing anything if we're not hovering within the game viewport. okay? So let's go to get IM GUI layer and then we'll go into the IM GUI layer and inside of here, we will just add in a method that says public game view window, get game view window, return this dot game view window. Okay, and then we can go back into the mouse listener. This should be good now and we should be all good there. Uh, and we're gonna add a couple more utility functions in here. So right above get screen X, I'm gonna add in public static vector 2F screen to world, which should convert screen coordinates to world coordinates. And we'll take fin vector 2F screen chords. And we're also going to have public static vector 2f world to screen which will take in a vector 2f world coordinates uh, just so that we can go back and forth right because th these are two very useful functions and we're going to need them coming up so we'll say vector 2f to go from screen to world uh, we're going to say the normalized screen chords equals a new vector 2f and we're going to take whatever screen coordinates they passed in. So we'll say dot X over window dot get width. And we'll say uh, screen chords dot Y, whatever they passed in over window dot get height. So what this is going to do is it's going to change our screen coordinates from zero to window width on the X and zero to window height to zero to one on both of these, right? So we're normalizing them. Then what we want to do is we want to multiply that by two. And we want to make sure we subtract one from both of those. And what this is gonna do is uh, shift it so that now our coordinates are on a range negative one to one, right? So basically we've gone to screen coordinates now to normalize device coordinates, which is sort of the same thing OpenGL does and what we're doing in our shaders, right? Cause that is how you go from screen to world coordinates. And then we'll say camera, camera equals window dot get scene dot get camera. Or I think dot camera. There we go. And we're going to create a temporary vector for if, which is going to have our normalized device coordinates. Or I guess it's called normalized screen chords, but at this point they are normalized device coordinates. And we'll say uh, use X, Y, and then we'll just do zero and one for the uh, Z and W. I will move that down to a new line so you guys can see that. And make sure that this is an equal sign. So we have this temporary vector X, Y, and then zero one. We've just sort of moved this into uh, vector four. Make sure to keep W to one too, because if you don't, you will get problems. And then we'll have matrix 4F inverse view, which equals a new matrix 4F camera dot get inverse view. And then we're gonna have a matrix 4F inverse projection, which is the camera's inverse projection, right? We're basically going backwards and this is how we do it. We use the inverse. Then we'll say temp dot multiply inverse view dot multiply and make sure you do parentheses exactly the same here because this is important and we're gonna do inverse projection this will just undo all of the things we did to get it to screen coordinates now we're basically going backwards and we should have it back in world coordinates so we've undid everything and then we can return a new vector to f temp.x temp.y okay so the math here is fairly straightforward if it confuses you i suggest taking a look at some abstract algebra books or I'm sorry, not abstract, but linear algebra books and uh, possibly looking at a few different answers on why this works the way it works. In OpenGL, we basically do projection times view times model, right? That's what we do there. Uh, and that gives us our screen coordinates. So if we want to go to world coordinates, which is basically the reverse of this, what we do is we just do 
uh, inverse projection. So that would be like this. It's not really raising it to a power. It's just the inverse times the inverse view times uh, the inverse projection, right? And I actually did this a little bit wrong. We just want the model, right? Or I guess this would be the screen coordinates in this case, right? So we take the screen coordinates times inverse view times inverse projection, which is what we're doing here. And that gives us world coordinates. So we're just reversing this. That's all we are doing. Uh, nothing too complicated. And then here we're just doing it in the correct order. So it's going to be very similar. We'll say camera camera equals uh, window dot get scene dot camera. And then we're going to say vector for F N D C space pose. So the normalized device coordinate space is a new vector for F world coordinates dot X world coordinates dot Y. And then we're going to say matrix for F view equals a new matrix for F camera dot get view matrix. And then we're going to say matrix for F projection equals a new matrix for F uh, camera dot get projection. And let's also add in zero one here. Once again, don't forget the one that is important. And then we're going to say NDC space pose dot multiply uh, projection dot multiply view and order of parentheses and everything matters a lot here as well. So uh, now we're just going the correct direction, right? To get us into basically screen coordinates. <laughs> so then we're going to say vector 2f window space equals new vector 2f and DC space pose dot X, which it really isn't anymore. And then that dot Y and we're going to multiply by one over NDC space pose dot W. Uh, so basically this multiplying by the W is sort of like, uh, this is almost like the FOV or something. Uh, I can't really remember off the top of my head exactly why the, the W works, but we basically want to make sure that we multiply by the inverse here because when we're doing all the matrix multiplication up here, that W ends up becoming very important. And this basically undoes what we do through this matrix multiplication. Okay. Then we're going to say window space dot add new vector two F one dot zero F one dot zero F dot multiply 0 0.5 F. Look, it's the reverse of this, right? We did multiply by two, uh, subtract one. Now we're adding one and we're multiplying by a half. So same exact thing. We're just doing it in reverse. And then we'll say window space dot multiply window or uh, new vector 2f window dot get width window dot get height. Okay. And if we take a look at multiply, because I wasn't sure if this would do the correct thing, but it does. Uh, this just is component wise multiplication, which you can see right here. And it basically just x times x, y times y, which is what we want in this case. Okay. So then we can just say return window space. And that should get our world to screen. So now we have screened world coordinates, world screen coordinates. Those are good utility functions that we will be using. Uh, let's go into properties window too, because basically what I want to do is this is mouse control stuff and it shouldn't be hidden in the properties window. So we're going to copy all of this and then we're going to go over to the mouse controls, which is really where that belongs. And then we're going to put this inside of our editor update method here. So we'll basically just do this and we already have a debounce in here. So that's good. We should be mostly good here, except we just want to make sure to grab the picking texture. So we'll say picking texture equals window dot get I am GUI layer dot get properties window dot get picking texture. And I think we just deleted that method, but now it's actually important. So let's go to properties window and we're going to add that back in. So we'll say public picking texture, get picking texture, return this dot picking texture. Okay. And then back into mouse controls. So we're getting that we should be good. And then we're going to also go ahead up here and we're going to say scene, uh, current scene equals window dot get scene because we will be needing that as well. We'll just import that and that should get us this. So we're almost back to where we were. And then right here, uh, we basically just want to add in window dot get, uh, I am GUI layer dot get properties window dot set active game object. So that should fix that. And then right here, we can just say window dot get I am GUI layer dot get properties dot clear selected. Okay. And that should do the same thing for us. Right. And this should basically be feature parity with what we had. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to do one thing to simplify this and move it down to here. We'll say else if, which should just sort of chain our logic together with this. So basically if they're holding something, then we don't want to take over here. Um, 
right? Because they're trying to place something right here. And if so, if they're not trying to place something and they click on to the screen, we want to check and see if they clicked an object. And if they did, we'll set it to the selected object. Okay. And let's go back into the properties window. And we'll just remove that code if we didn't already. I'm not sure if we did. Yeah, we left it in here. So we can just remove this whole update method now because it's not really necessary. And we'll go ahead and remove that debounce as well. And let's go ahead and if we hit Shift F10, we should still be able to do the same thing. Uh, we've got an error, which is just we don't have this function anymore, which is fine. We'll just remove it. And if we click, we still get the selected game object. If we click off, we don't. Okay, cool. So that's still good. We have all of that working properly. Um, so we've just sort of abstracted some logic there. Let's go back into the mouse controls because now we want to add in new mouse controls, which are basically the, the dragging that I showed you, right? So we'll go down here and we'll say else if the mouse listener dot is dragging and mouse listener dot mouse button down jillfw mouse button left. So we'll basically just check and see if they are dragging and they're pressing the left mouse button. Uh, we're gonna have this helper variable, we'll say if not box select set. So basically if they haven't started already, uh, we'll add this up to the top. So basically this will be a boolean that tells us that they have started dragging the mouse, right? So we'll say private boolean box select set equals false by default. So basically, if they have not set it, then we want to mark where they started to click and drag. That way we have that position. So we'll go up here and we'll also have a private vector 2f, which is box select start. And we'll just initialize that to an empty vector 2f. And then we'll also have a private vector 2f box select end, which is also an empty vector 2f. Then we'll scroll back down to here. So if they have not started dragging yet, then we'll say window dot get I am GUI layer dot get properties window dot clear selected. So we want to make sure we clear anything that is selected since we've started dragging the mouse. And we'll say box select start equals mouse listener dot get screen coordinates. So this will basically just get where the mouse is on the screen. And then we'll say box select set equals true. So we basically say, okay, make sure not to keep resetting this over and over again because uh, we know we're dragging the mouse now. And then what we'll do is we'll just say box select end equals mouse listener dot get screen. So every frame will just keep setting that over and over until they stop selecting. And then we're going to say vector 2f box select start world. So the start in world coordinates is mouse listener dot screen to world box select start and vector 2f box select end in the world is equal to mouse listener dot screen to world box select end. Uh, so now we have the beginning and the end, and then we're just going to do one more helpful thing, which is half size, just so that we can draw the green box. So we'll say is equal to a new vector 2f box select end world dot sub box select start world. And I will move this to a new line because that's getting big dot multiply by 0.5f. So we basically just get half the size of whatever they're dragging, and then we can say debug draw dot add box 2d and we'll say new vector 2f box select start world and we'll want to make sure to add the half size and then we'll say new vector 2f half size dot multiply by 2.0 and then rotation will set to zero okay so basically we just had to do this a little bit weird because we have the start but when we add the box here we want the center so we add a half the size to get the center then we multiply the half size by two to get the full size and that should add a green box so if we go ahead and we click when we click and start dragging we should see a green box but we're not so i know exactly what's going on there we basically just want to make sure that we're calling end frame inside of our window at least i suspect this is what's wrong so let's go into the window class and right down here uh Right before we swap buffers, I'll go ahead and say uh, mouse listener dot end frame. And I think that should fix our problem. So if we go back in. One other thing that I will mention real quickly uh, while we're solving this bug is to go into I am GUI layer and then inside of the scroll callback, just add an else here and then clear the mouse listener. That was for another bug where basically if you started scrolling out, then it would continue scrolling even though you didn't want it to. So this should fix that problem.
Now about this bug though, let's see what's causing that. And it looks like I was just dumb and accidentally deleted a piece of code that was important. <laughs> we should have left that get dot mouse button down is greater than zero, get dot is dragging is true. Okay, so with that out of the way, now if we click and drag, there we go, you see we get this green box and it's not quite right. Why is it not quite right? Uh, the Y is off. Well, I think that's probably has to do with the window. If we go into the window class, you'll see that what I'm returning inside of get width and get height is the actual width and height, which you would think is good. But uh, in a lot of cases, what I'm actually expecting is the frame buffer size, which is always 3840 by 2160. And this is not a float. So instead of this, if we return uh, whatever your actual window size, what the full screen window size you would expect it to be is, if we do that, I think, yeah, now it's corrected. Uh, this bug threw me off for such a long time because I had no idea what was going wrong, but there is basically just a big gap in my knowledge and what I was expecting and what I was actually getting. Uh, one thing that you'll notice is we never reset it. The start is always the same. So once we actually finish selecting, if we go back into mouse controls, how do we know when they've finished selecting once they've released the mouse? Well, we know that if basically, if they're not dragging, if they're not doing anything, but box select is set, that means that they did drag. And so if it is set, then we basically want to just make sure we set it to false, uh, which will allow us to reset it, right? So if we do that, then if we go into here, you'll see that it resets now. But this also tells us once they're done dragging, so we can check and see if they actually multi-selected anything, right? So we'll say int screen start x equals int box select start dot x. And we'll say int screen start y equals int box select start dot y. And we'll say int screen end x equals int box select end dot x. <laughs> I'm sure you can guess what I'm going to type next. So we're basically just getting all these values, which we're going to use in just a minute. And we'll say box select start dot zero and box select end dot zero, just to make sure that those values are completely reset. And then we'll say if screen end X is less than screen start X, we just want to swap them. That way we have these in the correct order. So we'll say int temp equals screen start X. And then we'll say screen start X equals screen end X. And then we'll say screen end X equals temp. So that should swap those values. And then we'll say if screen end y is less than screen start y, then we do the same thing. We'll say int temp equals screen start y, screen start y equals screen end y. And then we'll say screen end y equals temp. Okay, and that should swap the values first. So now we have them in the correct order. Screen start is on the left, screen y is on the bottom as it should be. So we can say float game object IDs and we'll basically just read all the pixels that are there. So we'll say picking texture dot read pixels and we're going to give it a new vector 2i for the start screen start x and screen start y. And then we'll give it a new vector 2i for the end, which is screen end x and screen end y. And that should be good. We should get a uh, set of game objects. So we'll import that. Uh, this should be all our game object IDs. And then what we're going to do is we only want the unique IDs, right? We don't want to add the same game objects multiple times. We just want the unique set. So we can use a set, which should give us just unique things. So a, a set of integer unique game object IDs equals a new hash set. So this is just a simple data structure in Java, which should make our lives a lot simpler. And then we'll go ahead and do this as well. And we'll just say for float game or object ID and game object IDs, unique game object IDs dot add int uh, obj ID. And this will just make sure that we get a unique set. So when we add to the set, if we already have one of these IDs in here already, it won't add it twice, which is perfect. That's exactly what we need. Then we'll say for integer uh, game object ID and unique game object IDs. So now we're going to loop through the ones we picked up and we'll say game object picked object equals window dot get scene dot get game object uh, by the game object ID. So we'll just pass that. And we'll say if the picked object is not null and the picked object does not have the non pickable component. So if that is null, which basically means that we can pick it, then we'll just say window 
dot get I am GUI layer dot add or get properties window dot add active game object picked object. Okay, so now we should have multi select. This should select all the game objects and add it if we don't already have it. So if we go into here, select all of these, and I hit delete. You'll notice that I almost deleted all of them. We didn't get this deleted. Why? Because we had two of them. Uh, it's also interesting if we select just one object, it just adds it as the game, active game object, right? And it doesn't matter where the box is, it just has to be in the correct bounds. One last thing I'm going to change real quick is if we go into the window, or actually I think the render, uh, we basically just want to make sure that our lines are on top. Actually, let's go back into the window, okay? So you'll notice when we go back into the game, when I drag the green box below these objects, you can't see it because it's not on top. Well, we can change that very easily in the window by just saying, uh, let's do our debug drawing. So we'll copy this and we'll do it after we render the scene. That way it's on top. So if we go back in, now we have this on top and debug drawings will always be on top, which is nice. So if we go, we select, uh, we multi-select, that works fine. That's good. Okay, uh, this tutorial has gone on for a long time and I have a feeling the next few tutorials are also gonna go on for a very long time too. If you want to check out all the source code that I have showed you at the beginning, you can look at the link in the description. Um, in the next episode, we'll continue working on the mouse controls and stuff and be getting a few more things. Uh, like I just selected these two objects, which if I delete, you can see, or actually I selected more, but it's hard to tell because we have no way of knowing, right? So uh, one of the things that I implemented in the actual version is like highlighting, right? If I select objects, it highlights which objects I selected so you know exactly what you've clicked on and all that stuff. So we will implement all of that uh, and more. One other thing I also implemented was if we place multiple objects, I still have some debug drawings going on, but basically it will only select one of each object even if you're holding down the mouse button, which you can see by that. Uh, we get some weird errors with the line staying on for a little bit too long, but you get the point. All right, anyways, like I said, that is it for this tutorial. If you enjoyed it, please hit like and subscribe and I'll see you in the next episode where we continue building off of this.